Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Aaron Braggins, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersett to talk about what makes computers tick. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED36. Um, oh, by the way, the three of you should probably introduce yourselves so people can hear your voices and associate them with a name. Hi, I'm Ryan. I build computers occasionally. Hi, I'm Brian. I use computers occasionally. <laughs> Hi, I'm Aaron. I also build uh, computers occasionally and use them. Uh, and I'm Ian, and, and I teach computer tech at a high school occasionally. <laughs> what do we do when we're not occasionally doing these things, I wonder? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm usually just teaching or podcasting, and that's about it. Now, since I teach computer tech at a high school, one of the major goals that I have when I'm teaching is I want to teach my students the things they need to know given that they are going to be living in a world where they're constantly surrounded by electronics. And one of the big things that really concerns me is that even though we live in this digital world, there are many, many people who just don't know how computers work. So you can consider this episode to be a computer hardware 101 class, essentially. This episode will also act as a primer for the next episode. Uh, Next month on The Extra Dimension, we will be joined by the same guests again, Aaron, Brian, and Ryan, uh, where we will be talking about how we have applied this knowledge of what these components in our computers do uh, to how we make our decisions uh, when we are buying computers. So basically we're going to be going over what are our preferences when it comes to uh, buying electronics. Here in this episode, we're going to go over several of the different components that make up a computer. We're going, for each one, we're going to talk about its function. We're going to talk about how we measure its specifications. So uh, what units do we use to measure how good it is? Uh, And we're going to talk about a few different brands that make each component. I I pay a lot of attention to brands. Um, You know, this isn't, I'm not buying cereal at the the supermarket, right? I can't afford to uh, buy the cheapest phone that I find find that you you know and and uh, then find out later that like oh this is actually like a plastic piece of crap and it falls apart in my hands um so i i do put a lot of stock in in branding because uh in the computer world because that's how i know that like a company is going to have my back is if they if if i know that they're going to have systems in place for that kind of thing yeah i've always found like with pc hardware um in the early days uh brands would do kind of like this almost bait and switch thing where they would have a couple cycles where they would have really really good hardware good Mm. good reviews awesome stuff and they'd get that hype train going and people would buy their product and then they would kind of teeter off a little bit and then they'd come back once they uh once they kind of lost some credibility but and this is like early days when like companies like Abit were still around. Um, I have never heard of that. Yeah, they. This is like 386. Uh, it, you know, like Intel Celeron days when like those were the prized after overclocking chips. Um, you know, but nowadays it seems like you got the standard name brands like Corsair and Asus and kind of the core like five or six that are really solid and. Like you're saying, look at like their RMAs. Um, if they seem like they're doing a real good job, uh, stay away from uh, companies that kind of have bad reviews. Uh, and you can find those on forums, YouTube channels, all over the place. All right, so the first component that we're going to talk about is the motherboard, which you can call a MOBO if you're feeling affectionate. It is the component that connects all of the other components together. Um, it'll have you know, a slot for the processor to go into. It has several slots for RAM. All the hard drives connect to it. Um, and uh, yeah, for the most part with a motherboard, 
the like the specs that we care about are basically just like how many different slots does it have there is there is a little bit that you can do when thinking about like you know it's it's bandwidth how fast it can transfer data from one component to another but like generally speaking that's not as large of an issue do you guys think that's fair to say i think there's some other aspects so there's there's motherboard size which is kind of a primary factor Mm -hmm. that that has to do with some other regards about building or buying a computer um form factor are you saying that like I couldn't use the same motherboard in a phone as I use in my desktop? Well, I mean, I guess you could, but it'd be a really big phone. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, if you're building a computer, then you're going to want to make sure that you select a motherboard that is going to fit inside the case that you're going to use. You're going to want to make sure that you have a motherboard that is compatible with the RAM and the CPU that you're using um, and you'll want to make sure that it has enough slots for all of the components that you're going to put into it. Now of course if you're building yourself a computer you will have to select which motherboard you want to put in it but the interesting thing about motherboards is that if you're buying a computer that is already built so whether it's a desktop or a laptop or a phone Most stores don't actually list what motherboard they put into the computer, so you usually don't get a choice. The CPU of a computer is the central processing unit, uh, also called the processor. By the way, that's one thing about most of these components is they have at least two different names that you'll hear being used interchangeably, uh, which makes things kind of tough to keep track of Um, but yeah the cpu is the component that does all of the math any any operations that the uh, computer has to do any computations if you will uh get sent to the cpu and it and it performs that um that that action cpus uh when we're talking about the specs for those uh we've got kind of two different uh main specs that we talk about one is the clock speed so Uh, That determines how many different operations it can do in a second, Um, and that's measured in hertz. Um, These days, we go all the way up to gigahertz, so that's, uh, what, like billions of hertz, right? Yep. I think that's that's the order of magnitude we're on. Um, And then the other spec that we talk about is how many cores does it have? Um, So a multi-core processor is basically like putting multiple different processors into a computer so that they can all do computations at the same time Um, in theory right having a four core processor is going to be four times as good as having a one core processor uh, if you keep the clock speed the same but we like most programs can't use all four cores at the same time so um, you don't quite get that like you know that much gain but then you can also toss in uh, turbo boost and hyper threading and yeah Then you're off and who knows what's what anymore. (laughs) So I'll mention here that there are sort of two major vendors for the computer market. You'll probably Mm -hmm. hear these names thrown about uh, in the following sections, such as AMD and Intel. And in the tablet and phone section, you'll probably hear a little bit about ARM and uh, some of the work that's going on over there. Yep. In the mobile space, so on phones and tablets, we have a few more manufacturers of processors. Um, the biggest one is Qualcomm. If you have uh, most most Android phones or Windows phones uh, run on Qualcomm processors, Apple actually makes their very own processors for all of the iPhones and iPads. Samsung makes their own processors for many of their phones. And uh, NVIDIA actually makes processors for tablets that are a little bit more focused on uh, graphics processing. Intel also used to make uh, phone processors, but they don't anymore. They got out of the game. For hard drives, uh, there's a, a... basically two different categories of hard drive Um, and by the way hard drives are what you use to store all of the information on your computer Um, so usually when people talk about like how big is your phone right it's a 64 gigabyte phone that's talking about the amount of storage that you have Um, for for hard drives uh, you either will have a solid state drive um, which is 
it's basically like a, a really big thumb drive, right? Yep. Um, that has more storage space than that. It doesn't have any moving components in it, um, which makes it like nice and fast. It it can read and write much faster than a traditional hard drive, which is a uh, it literally has a spinning metal disc inside that a magnetic arm uh, has to like move back and forth over in order to read the information that's on it, um, and all of those moving components cause a you know a more delay than than a solid state drive uh, when it comes to reading and writing. Um, so for those, of course, we talk about how much storage they can they they have right, uh, usually measured in gigabytes or terabytes. Uh, and then uh, you can also talk about how how fast it can read and write. It's important to note that when we're dealing with phones, uh, phones always have solid state storage because it would be uh, not a good idea to put a spinning disk hard drive into a phone. For one thing, they have to be much larger. Um, the act of physically spinning this disk actually takes up a lot more battery than a solid state would. Um, and so, yeah, they, they are never, ever, ever do they put spinning hard drives into phones. Um, if you go back far enough, though, the original iPod actually had a spinning hard disk drive in it instead of a solid state drive, which is a, a very interesting thing. Um, in laptops nowadays, uh, it is getting much, much more common to have solid state drives in them instead of spinning disk drives um, for the aforementioned uh, battery and size um, advantages. And the reason that solid state drives, of course, aren't just used everywhere is because they cost a lot more per gigabyte than a traditional hard disk drive does. So a lot of times in desktops, what people will do is they will put uh, one solid state drive into their desktop and use that as the drive where they um, they install their operating system onto it, they install most of their programs onto it, so that all of those files will load much quicker and they can uh, start up their program, start up the computer much, much faster. But then they also have one or more uh, hard disk drives in them in order to uh, take advantage of that larger capacity storage that doesn't cost as much. A few of the notable brands that make uh, hard drives and, uh, and solid state drives are Seagate, Western Digital, Samsung, and Toshiba. I forgot to mention RAM. That's a really important one. Uh, RAM is random access memory, um, and this is this is one of the the things that I get pedantic about when people talk about their computer and they talk about how much memory it has, um, but they're talking about storage um, because RAM is is separate from storage. Um, it, it's basically like. <clears throat> temporary storage that your computer uses to uh, store any files for programs that it currently has open. Um, so, for example, if you, like, start up your computer and you open Chrome, uh, then, you know, it'll, it'll take a couple seconds for Chrome to open the first time. But then, if you already have Chrome open and you open a new window, it's almost instantaneous because all of those files that are required to run Chrome are already loaded into the RAM. Um, the first time, it had to load everything from the hard drive. Um, so for, for RAM, it's much, much faster than even a solid state drive, uh, but it is uh, much, much smaller because it's much more expensive to, to, to make large capacities of RAM. One of the other um, important things to note about RAM is that if stuff goes on it and then the power is cut, it leaves. Uh, yeah. So it depends on the computer being powered we call that volatile memory sure why not it's like a it's like a tweet but worse um you know one of, one of the interesting things about ram is there's sort of a new development in recent times sort of this hybrid approach of combining ram and long-term storage sort of be this um all-purpose general put anything you want anywhere you want it whoa yep and you're not talking about swap memory right no i'm oh. talking about the future 
Now, RAM along with the processor are the two main components that you would look at to determine how good a computer is. If you just you know, need to forget about everything else and you just need to look at like one or two things, the CPU and the RAM are going to be the two things that you want to evaluate. When evaluating RAM, the main spec that we take a look at is how much memory it can store, um, and that's measured in gigabytes. Um, we can also talk about clock speed, but that's much less common uh, to be listed on a store page. There are many, many, many different companies that make RAM, uh, but a few of the main ones are Corsair, Samsung, uh, G-Skill, and Kingston. Graphics cards are a very, very interesting category because really graphics cards are, are kind of like a computer unto themselves uh, that you just slap on into your computer to do more computing. Um, <laughs> they have their own processing units in them. Um, they have uh, their own random access memory built in. Um, they're pretty crazy, uh, and especially if you're like doing a, a gaming computer that's going to be the most expensive component uh, in in the computer um, and yeah you I mean I can't really think of a, like one single spec that I would talk about for a graphics card I just kind of know like where in a, in the product lineup a particular graphics card falls yeah uh, yeah yeah because there's there's so much going on. You can talk about clock speed and the number of cores, just like you can with a central processing unit, um, because essentially graphics cards just have a processor built into them. Um, the clock speed tends to be much, much lower on a graphics card than on a CPU. Um, however, the number of cores that a graphics card has tends to be way, way higher. So in a typical computer, you might have somewhere between four and eight cores. Uh, in a graphics card, you can have up into the thousands of cores. Graphics cards also have their own dedicated RAM that they use, uh, and that can uh, be somewhere in the in the one to four gigabyte range these days. Um, I'm sure it will be increasing uh, very, very quickly as we go into the future as well. I think there's sort of three broad parts of that. So you can ask how many physical ports do you need? So oh, if, yeah, yeah. if it's a desktop type of computer, you're going to have the option of zero, one to, I don't know, up to six maybe ports. Mm -hmm. uh, if, it's a, if it's more of a laptop or a phone, you're going to be significantly constrained in that regard. Typically, you don't have multiple displays with those options. Um, and then you'll probably be thinking about performance and its internal capabilities. Um, so that, that can get kind of murky, and there's no, there's no linear way to determine if one card is faster than the other card without basically just brute forcing it and benchmarking both. Yep. Yeah. Um, I do love when companies talk about how many teraflops their yeah, like, that's so useful. graphics card has <laughs> because, um, well, one, yeah, it's 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 a number that doesn't necessarily have to do with like the performance in real life, but also teraflops just sounds like a made up word. I'd also want to say like jumping to graphics cards and CPUs. Yeah. Um, there are some uh, CPU vendors that can actually. Uh, put a graphics card on the CPU itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The two main companies that make graphics cards are NVIDIA and AMD. Um, and note that that only applies to computers that have their own dedicated separate graphics card. Um, some computers, like most phones, a lot of laptops, uh, and a lot of lower-end uh, desktops will have the processor, the central processing unit, take over all of the functions that the graphics card would otherwise uh, do. For a power supply, that's literally the, the part of the computer that like takes the, um, what is it, alternating current from, from the wall and uh, converts it into direct current for all of the components in the computer. Um, and for those, you just need to make sure that you've got a power supply that has, like, that can support enough watts for all of the components that you've got. Um, 
And then there's also like, you know, more expensive ones are going to be more power efficient. So you lose less energy in that conversion process. Um, for the case of a computer, that's literally just the box that you put it in. Um, so you can go all the way from like tiny little, you know, like miniature uh, computers that'll that'll fit in the palm of your hand, uh, all the way on up to like a massive uh, gaming laptop with LEDs and fans everywhere, and you know a, a clear side on the case so that you can see the components on the inside, and yeah, um, they can get pretty gaudy. If you but ask who, me, but who needs a case for their computer anyway? You you don't need a case to run a computer. If you want it to last more than a year, you might need a case. <laughs> I uh, will have a picture, or there's like a, a famous picture I've seen of like pizza box cases for computers. Where they oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Components. Hot glued or just in a box of pizza. I am tickled by the idea of, uh, I think they call them stealth builds, where you take a bunch of modern components and put them inside a case that looks like, you know, an old crappy like Dell Optiplex or something like that. And then it's <laughs> like, oh, yeah, this is actually a really good gaming computer. A beige gateway from 2002. <laughs> Cooling. So, like, one of the things that is easy to overlook is the fact that no matter how powerful the components in your computer are, they're only going to be useful if you can prevent them from overheating. And, uh, and so that's a, a big focus in a lot of computer builds is making sure that, um, for example, if you are air cooling it, that you have like all of the fans in your case and on your components kind of coordinating so that they're all blowing air in one consistent direction. Um, I, I like to, you know, make sure that I <clears throat> don't keep the, the stock CPU cooler that comes with the CPU. I invest like $20 or so in a better cooler. Um, just, you know, increases the lifespan of, of the CPU drastically. Um, you can also water cool computers. I've never done that. Has anybody here ever played around with that? I want to. I have, I have one in my, uh, or a liquid cooler in my Hackintosh because I put I swapped motherboards and cases with my server because I wanted a smaller case and then realized my stupid big Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evo thing was too tall mm -hmm. and so <laughs> I bought a liquid cooled thing which was also way too overkill and I should have bought the smallest liquid cooler but did you alas. do you know if it was a closed loop system or like custom built closed loop Corsair okay uh whatever it's got two fans I didn't need that one. Sure. I only needed the one fan. Yeah, I've done both. I um, I've, I'm have i leaning towards closed loop now. So what I meant by like custom build is you actually cut all the tubes, buy a CPU block, a GPU block. Basically, every component you want to cool, you custom cut tubes and run, uh, what is it, uh, either plastic tubes. Um, that's what I used. Or some people use like glass tubes. Um, there's some really creative people out there, but I find it to be kind of a pain in the butt. Yeah. Thinking about all the ways that that could go wrong is giving me anxiety. <laughs> yeah. That's why I went closed loop. Yeah. I just needed it for the CPU. So, and, um, I mean, a, a water cooled system, uh, will typically last a lot longer than a, an air cooled system with less maintenance, uh, right? Because you don't you don't have all of this air blowing through with with you know all this dust collecting because um, the fans are outside of the case, correct? No, the fans are still no. in the case. Oh, it's usually just pulling air in through the radiator, so mm -hmm. the the water goes through a radiator. So there are still fins that you are blowing air through. So there's still places for dust to collect. I think okay. the surface area is probably somewhat comparable. They're generally you know, flatter, but a little bit longer. Yeah. So versus just a giant block of aluminum mm -hmm. fins. Yeah, they're okay. super efficient and quiet. That's the big mm -hmm. benefit of mm -hmm. water cooling. Okay, okay. Now it's important to note here that the air cooling and liquid cooling that we've been talking about so far is all uh, considered active cooling. So that is where you have 
you're, you're using power to cool down the um, the computer smaller devices like phones and tablets they don't have any room to spare to put any fans in there and frankly you wouldn't want to use up all your battery life uh, by powering a fan to blow air across them so they use what is called passive cooling um, and that is the big big limiter on how powerful their cpus can be um, because the processor uh, generates a lot of heat as it's doing its computations. And so that is the uh, big advantage that desktops have, is that they can um, run their, their processors much, much hotter because they are constantly being cooled by these fans and, uh, and, and coolers that, um, that are attached to their CPUs. But on a phone or a tablet, you don't have that. And so that's why you uh, often find your phone is you know getting too hot when you're playing like Pokemon Go or something uh, something else that's very intensive um, and uh, we're actually starting to see more laptops that are passive cooled as well um, it used to be the case that uh, laptops would always have a small fan inside and um, whenever the device was doing something intensive you'd hear it whir up and um, make a lot of noise um, but we're, we're seeing a lot more laptops, especially the smaller form factor laptops, that uh, just rely on radiating heat away from themselves uh, via their, the, the surface of, of the laptop's body. Um, and actually, that, that is one thing that, um, for example, MacBooks do, is they're made entirely of l aluminum, and the aluminum body helps to conduct heat away from the processor. Um, now, of course, the MacBooks also have fans in them, so they uh, kind of take advantage of both strategies. We're also starting to see some tablets that have fans in them as well, which is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, because we're, we're starting to see things like the uh, Microsoft Surface, which uh, is running a full copy of Windows instead of a traditional uh, iOS or Android op mobile operating system. And uh, so, yeah, because the Surface, which, you know, from the outside looks like a tablet, uh, but it's running a full desktop operating system, it uh, needs to cool itself down because it's, uh, it's working a bit harder. Than your, uh, than your typical laptop. Uh, and then uh, we have the note here, all the RGBs. This sounds like a Brian thing. No, that was not me, actually. Oh. That was me. That's just a joke, because that's... <laughs> everyone wants all the manufacturers right now. You can't, like, walk into a computer store without having a seizure because they're blinking lights. And, <laughs> I mean, it's, it, I'm torn. I Sometimes it can be gaudy, but other times it's subtle and it looks good. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I generally go with the approach of no lights at all. Just give me a computer that works. And Yeah. 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 I agree with that approach. It's darkness all the way. I totally accidentally um, bought a bunch of components for my computer that were black with blue LEDs, and I was like, oh, that's a happy coincidence. Yeah, they generally like to stick to one color uh, mm -hmm. across brands. Like, one's red, one's blue, one's green in their just basic set. Um, I prefer blue, personally. And then you have the expensive adapters and things that'll do programmable RGB colors and you can <laughs> sync it to your keyboard and you drop $600 on this whole thing. <laughs> yep. Fellas, where can people find you on the internet? Let's have our guests go first. Uh, oh, you can find me on Twitter at 8 Aaron. That's about it. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me. And of course, you can find me, Ryan, just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at RyanMar, and of course, on my website, ryanrampersad.com. You can find me on uh, Mastodon. I've been trying to use that a lot more recently uh, at Ian R. Buck at mastodon.cloud. Um, or I suppose my woefully underused website, ianrbuck.com. <laughs> Did you lose the lottery again? I may have, you know. It's, nope, you're up. It's a problem. You're up. You're fine. You're good. 
The Extra Dimension is a production of The Nexus TV. We are a network of uh, technology-focused podcasts. The Extra Dimension is released under a Creative Commons license, so feel free to use any part of it as, as you see fit, as long as you link back to this page, which is thenexus.tv slash TED36. Uh, if you want to connect with other listeners and comment on this episode, please go to our subreddit at r slash TV. If you can support The Extra Dimension financially, we would love to have you join us over on our Patreon, where you can get cool rewards like access to The Fringe, which is our behind-the-scenes show, as well as getting to help us pick topics for future episodes. Our Patreon can be found at patreon.com slash the nexus tv and remember that uh, no matter where you're listening to this you should definitely go and subscribe to the extra dimension in your favorite podcast player so that you don't miss out on any new episodes until next time have a good one have a good one have a good one have a good one The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence. Tech news is dominated by big announcements with big bombastic personalities. Developers, 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 developers. Sometimes they make us laugh. Yes, I'd like to order four thousand lattes to go, please. Sometimes we laugh at them. Courage. Sometimes we're filled with awe. There it is. Whoa! Check that out. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes they throw shade. Toxic hell stew. Sometimes they inspire. Live, learn, and love. They never want us to forget. Remember? That the show's never over. Because... I got one more thing. Now, it's often difficult to make the journey to see these events live. This is a freaking dirt road! Oh my god! (laughs) But we here at the Nexus TV have got you covered. On our show, Nexus Special, we recap and analyze all the biggest announcements and keynote events in the tech world. So come join us as we explore the brave new worlds that await us. Subscribe to Nexus Special in your favorite podcast player today.